अच्छा am i visible or audible so we are yes yes uh hello hello uh, am, uh, we are live now uh, we are live now yes, yes i hope you can hear me right yes ma'am yes we can hear you properly uh, yes ma'am uh, we you, can hear you thank you that is all that is all okay. yes okay. ma'am uh, good morning to all participants uh, welcome to our uh, two day national uh, webinar on uh, rereading and recontextualizing literary text uh, in times of pandemic uh, today is the second uh, day of the webinar uh, our first day of the webinar yesterday was uh, definitely a huge success uh, it started with the keynote address of uh, professor devnarayan bandopadhyay honorable vice chancellor bankura university uh, west bengal uh, followed by uh, three distinguished speakers uh, dr arno bray dr fayaz ahmed ilkal and uh, finally the joint session by uh, ananna chatterjee and nishar bhattacharya uh, i would like to recommend and request uh, uh, those who somehow missed it yesterday to kindly watch the program by clicking uh, on the youtube link that is already provided to your mail ids Uh, today we have two more uh, distinguished speakers uh, shyam gupta das and dr shubhadeep pal uh, they will, dr shubhadeep pal will be uh, with us shortly we have among us uh, dr mithali uh, gangopadhyay associate professor and uh, coordinator iqsc of uh, minalini dot mahavidyalaya uh, dr uh, mithali gangopadhyay shall chair the session uh, that follows uh, welcome ma'am Uh, we are humbled and honored uh, with your uh, presence uh, with us uh, over to you ma'am thank you for being with us over to you please uh, continue ma'am ma'am can yes. you hear fine so should i begin then can you hear me hear us okay so can i begin can i begin the session uh i think there is a certain problem uh please uh, stay with us uh ma'am uh, can you hear us yes i can i can ma'am can you okay so i have already uh, introduced uh, you and introduced you so kindly continue uh, continue with uh, okay. uh, by introducing shyam dipta das okay okay thank you over to you ma'am okay thank um uh, respected principal sir dr anand mohan roy iqsc coordinator uh faculties of english department shudipto and shamim I convey my heartiest thanks to all of you for uh, inviting me to chair this particular session of the second day of your webinar entitled Rereading and Recontextualizing Literary Text in Times of Pandemic. I must say that I am I was very impressed when I saw the topic of the webinar because I thought that this webinar would offer all of us an opportunity to revisit the literary text in a very different context uh now see the literary text uh, are product of a particular milieu but responses to such literary text cannot be confined to any particular milieu time or space responses to a particular text depend much on the context when the text is being read when the text is being analyzed and in this context the pandemic uh, covid 19 world becomes very significant so it is in this context of the pandemic world that we will try to read the texts again to visit the texts again to understand them in a fresh and a new way um i'm really delighted that uh, we have today two young uh, participants two young uh speakers for the day the first speaker is shwayam dipto dash 
Chayamditu is a lecturer in the Department of English, Norishingo Dotto College, Haura. He completed his MA from Presidency University and his MPhil from the University of Calcutta. He has publications in various international journals, including Rupkotha, and has contributed a chapter in a forthcoming anthology of essays to be published by Rutledge later this year. So I invite Shoyam Dittodaj to uh, read his paper, to present his paper to us. Over to Shoyam Thank you so much for the kind, inter kind introduction, ma'am. Uh, am I audible and uh, visible? Yes. Yes, yes you, are. you are. You are. You are audible and visible. You are audible and visible, Shyam Dipta. You are. Please continue. Shwamdutu, we can both see and hear you. Okay. You can okay. continue okay. with your okay. paper. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the members of Amdanga Jugal Kishore Mahavidyalaya, respected principal, sir, members of the IQAC. Sorry, I didn't get you. Am I visible now? Yes, you are. You are perfectly visible and perfectly audible. So kindly carry on. Carry on. I think for some reason uh, he got disconnected. Uh, uh, I hope he will be back soon. Yes, uh, he's back. My uh, uh, yes, you are audible and visible. Please uh, yeah. continue. Please continue. My audible now? Yes, yes, you, you are, are uh, you audible are. and visible. Thank you. Thank you. Kindly continue. Kindly continue with your paper. Philosophical. I mean, for some reason, I think he is getting disconnected. Uh, yes, uh, that is a, an issue, actually. Uh, I understand. Uh, so uh, I uh, I would request uh, the participants to be patient with us for some time, please. Uh, I hope he will be back with his uh, device all OK. Uh, so kindly be with us. Thank you for your patience. So Shandipa is back again. Uh, so, Shyam uh, are you uh, are you able to hear me? Six minutes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can I start? Am I? Yes, yes of course. Please of course, you can. Start. Yes, I'm here, able to Please. hear you. Is my audio audio okay, all right? Absolutely. Yes, yes, you're all right. Absolutely. Yes, I can hear you. You please continue. You please continue. Do not stop. Yes. So. Yes, okay, 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 okay. So, uh, in this presentation, I would offer a philosophical 
and political reading of the pandemic situation vis a vis the writings of Giorgio Agamben, Jacques Derrida, and Emmanuel Levinas. My topic would mainly delve into the ways in which the event of any pandemic rewrites the familiar domains of political democracy and opens up a messianic space which bears infinite political potential for imagining more inclusive and idealistic forms of democracy. Something akin to what Jacques Derrida in his later political thought would term as the democracy to come. While many recent political com commentators, including Bruno Latour, Jean-Luc Nancy, have expressed reasonable fears that the COVID pandemic, which has coerced many governments to impose stringent lockdown measures and severe forms of statist surveillance, shall ultimately accelerate the slow but sure death of democracy. I shall put forward a counterintuitive point that the event of the pandemic presents before us the face of a radical other or an unknown stranger, something which in Levinas's philosophy of radical ethicality prompts us to move beyond the ipsity or smugness of our selfdom and thus recondition the very contours of the individual and collective sovereign self. The ethico-political encounter of democracy with this radical alterity, which Levinas would also term in many of his writings as the ill er leads to an opening up of the democratic order to a certain kernel of uncertainty. An uncertainty which is not regressive or immanent, but, there are, but rather transcendental in its messianic possibilities. Slavoj Žižek, in his Slavoj Žižek, in his latest book, Pandemic, COVID-19 Shakes the World, which is a very recent publication, in a chapter curiously titled, Welcome to the Viral Desert, extends the symbolic implications of the COVID virus and uses it as a metaphor to describe the workings of ideology itself. He says, and I quote, the ongoing spread of the coronavirus epidemic has also triggered a vast epidemic of ideological viruses which were lying dormant in our societies. The well-grounded medical need for quarantines find an echo in the ideological pressure to establish clear borders and to quarantine enemies who pose a threat to our identity." Unquote. He cites the example of some of the stock responses of certain sovereign nation states to the pandemic, which includes Turkey's plans to deport over a million Syrian refugees to the shores of Europe, and the obvious rise of xenophobic populists in many parts of the world who wish to create a homogeneous nation state along the stringent lines of the us and them. Perhaps Zizek is trying to imply that the corona epidemic has a political and ontological similarity to the foreigner, the radical other, or in Christopher's terms, the abject other, which suddenly leads to an exasperation of political defense mechanisms that desperately attempt to retain the sanctimony and purity of the imagined homogeneous community of the nation state. It would be interesting to draw an analogy between the curious workings of the recent COVID parasite 
and Derrida's own thinking on parasitism and virology. Derrida in a book which was published in around 1990, Limited Incorporated, says, and I quote, it should be remembered that the parasite is by definition never simply external, never something that can be simply excluded or kept outside of the body proper, shut out from the familiar table or house, unquote. In other words, the parasite is always already part of the host whose specters forever haunt the dwelling of the self of the host, calling it to defend its oikos or its vital economy. The parasite, according to Derrida, is undesirable since it interferes with what the host desires the most, that is, a clarity of borders, a certain distinction between boundedness and unboundedness of the dwelling of the self. The viral parasite therefore addresses us as an enemy only in so far as we identify with the body proper as the essential biological and political metonym of our life. The paranoic vision of a certain outsider interfering with the boundedness of the sameness of the self is often displayed in literary and cinematic representations of dystopias. However, the genre of the dystopia, which conversely also contains the right possibilities of messianic utopias or alternative visions of the society, very often fail to evoke true alterities to our social and democratic order. Frederick Jameson, writing on the simulation of dystopias in popular media in the 21st century, he mainly talks about cinema, in an essay titled American Utopia, you see, he begins with the observations and a quote, we have seen a marked diminution in the production of new utopias over the last decades, along with an overwhelming increase in the in all manner of conceivable dystopias, most of which look monotonously alike. The homogenization of dystopias is symptomatic of our collective inability to imagine newer and alternative social orders. As Zizek once claimed in a film, in a short film, which he made the Perverts Guide to Ideology, he says, it is possible to imagine the end of the world, but never the end of capitalism itself. In order to understand the reasons why conditionally inclusive liberal democracies premised on the principles of capitalism, survive and refuse to mutate into newer and more radical forms, we must understand how one of the principal validating kernels of sovereign power, which the famous Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben would call as the state of exception, suddenly exaggerates during the time of an emergency or a catastrophic pandemic. Referring to the knee-jerk reaction of Western liberal democracies to the event of the pandemic, Agamben writes in a recent article which appears in the European Journal of Psychoanalysis, it appeared only two months back, he says, and I quote, the pandemic causes many things to appear that one could tended not to see. The epidemic or pandemic has caused to appear with clarity the fact that the state of exception to which governments have habituated us for some time has truly become the normal condition. The state of exception means the temporary suspension of democratic rights and the rule of law 
during which the sovereign assumes extraordinary legal and juridical powers in a bid to protect it from some foreign invasion. The essence of sovereign power is to be understood as the monopoly on the inability to decide when the state of exception should be imposed. Even in modern liberal democracies, which near the facade of agency as well as liberty, this hidden kernel of absolute decision making as regards the imposing of the state of exception is often concealed under the veneer of the supposed rule of law. According to Carl Schmitt, Carl Schmitt is a, again another philosopher who influenced Agamben in uh, defining the contours of the state of exception. Uh, Carl Schmitt was uh, instrumental in uh, understanding the Nazi regime through this logic of the state of exception. Carl Schmitt says that the state of exception functions along the lines of a simple paradox in order to identify the extraneous threat to a political or social order one must first be rid of one's internal and domestic opponents only then can the true threat of a foreign enemy be neutralized Thus, the actual aim of an extended paradigm of a state of exception, which Agamben states is the stock ex is the stock reaction of most liberal democracies to the COVID outbreak, is to authorize or co-opt radical alterities within the system itself, and to create the homogeneous contours of a selective democratic self. In the Nazi regime. This took the form of the invention of the Jew as the foreign other and the subsequent arrest and vilification of all those as conspirational accomplices who dismissed the narrative myth of a homogeneous nation state. Similarly, during the AIDS pandemic of the 1980s, a similar repressive mechanism comes into force which uses the context of the virus to weed out or marginalize homosexual or queer others in a bit to define the nation state and its biopolity in terms of the repressive hegemony of compulsory heterosexual heteronormative reproduction. In other words, the state of exception reinstates the borders between the us and the them. This extended state of exception bears witness to the contemporary medical imperative to self-isolate, along with a heightened restriction upon mobility, mobility itself, both in its physicalist and metaphoric currency indicates a disruption of the hierarchical status quo, the immanent hierarchical status quo, and the normative order of things. The democratic access to the lines of class, caste, and interracial mobility is similarly thwarted under this state-ordained dictum to remain stationed in one's dwelling. The paranoid response of the state authorities to the movement of Syrian refugees in Turkey or the movement of the migrant workers across India during the lockdown is not to be merely read in terms of the biomedical logic of contagion, but should be regarded as symptoms of an extended paradigm of the state of exception that desperately wants to protect the rather porous lines that exist between the sovereign self and its other others along the lines of class, race, caste, and precarity. 
the etymology of contagion is very similar to the word contamination. Both words stem from the Latin word tangere, meaning to touch, and both terms carry overtones of tainting, coloring, infection caused by a form of touching together or admixture. Thus, the fear of contagion is related to the politically loaded signifier of contamination referred to Agamben in the earlier passages. The pertinent question to be asked here is that what do we actually imply when we say that our society is in dire need of a medicine to contain this deadly contagion of coronavirus. The illness being referred to here is not merely bodily or simply ideological, as Susan Sontag would have it, but, in, but encompasses the biopolity in ways whose affective fields subtend to the material matrices of social existence as well. The immunity that we all ask for unconsciously reveals the workings of a political regime that desperately attempts to guard and protect the body proper from the contamination of uncooptable, uncooptable elements both within and outside. Is absolute immunity of liberal democratic apparatuses the sad fate of democracy as it slowly slides into extremist political polarities? The recent rise of the alternative right in Europe and America and the extremist left positions in Asia, in China for, uh, in particular. Is this the sad fate of democracy as it slides into these extreme polarities? It is no surprise that in the run-up to the COVID vaccine, both the US and China have inadvertently prophesied their political destinies. So does the event of the pandemic and democracy's desperate urge to opt for a cure against its contagion or contamination preempt us from thinking of an alternative social order? Here I wish to content vis-a-vis -vis the Deritian and Levinasian idea of unconditional hospitality that the solution lies not in a protective cure from the ideological virus, but in the gesture of vulnerability. In Derrida's own words, in an essay titled, At this very moment, in this work, here I am, he says, contamination or contagion is not a risk, but a fate that must be assumed. This gesture of being vulnerable to contamination from the other is something akin to the ethico-political gesture of unconditional hospitality, to which he increasingly turns post the events of 9-11. And Derrida was of course influenced by Levinas in this idea of unconditional hospitality. It uh, basically refers, unconditional hospitality basically refers to the welcoming of the other, the stranger, without trying to appropriate its otherness. It involves a moving away from the totalitarian contours of the self and the welcoming to the other, even at the cost of being dethroned from one's own dwelling or rules or political economy. In Levinas's words, the gaze of the other calls into question my own being at home. With myself. This gesture, however, entails a certain risk taking, and this is important. Why is it? Why does it involve a risk? Because it could subsequently lead to either an usurpation or a destruction of my own home or ethos. Derrida hints at this danger in his essay of hospitality. He writes, 
for unconditional hospitality to take place, you have to accept the risks of the other coming and destroying the place, initiating a revolution, stealing everything, or killing everyone. Unquote. This vulnerability of democracy to an uncharted risk of the radical other is precisely the autoimmunitary mechanism of democracy that shall resurrect its health and keep its messianic possibilities alive. Does this vulnerability or autoimmunity of democracy paradoxically involves a breaking down of its own defense mechanisms or immunitary systems so as to protect and sustain itself in the long run. Democracy does in order to protect itself and its alternative futures must immunize itself against its own immunity or defense mechanisms. Vulnerability or autoimmunity defined thus gives democracy life and play and in the words of Derrida, it nurtures an opening to what is to come in the possibility of infinite recasting, reworking, and differential reiteration. As capitalist market mechanisms premised upon utilitarian grounds falter in Europe and elsewhere, and President Erdogan's anti-refugee policies face an unprecedented backlash, backlash in Turkey, and the Chinese Communist rule itself seems to be nearing an inevitable end in the face of a silent but growing network of solidarity among its dissenters. It is time to ask whether the COVID virus is actually brewing up a perfect storm in Europe and elsewhere. As Zizek Leitz writes in his latest book, Maybe another and much more beneficent etiological virus will spread and hopefully infect us. The virus of thinking of an alternative society, a society beyond a nation state, a society that actualizes itself in the form of global solidarity and cooperation. The biblical injunction to love thy neighbor as thyself is a call, is actually a call for unconditional hospitality. And Christ, the figure of the Messiah, tells his followers before his own resurrection that he shall return only when there is unconditional love and solidarity amongst his followers. The figure of the resurrected Christ as the impossible kernel of messianicity. It should be noted here that Derrida differentiates between Messiah and messianicity. He always opts for messianicity, something which never arrives in the first place. The messiah never arrives. But in its waiting, we can actually possibly move beyond our own city, move beyond our own self to something which is new, something which is to come. So the figure of the resurrected Christ as the impossible kernel of messianicity tells his followers, do not touch me. Touch and deal with other people in the spirit of love. While corporeal distancing becomes a norm and we are constantly reminded of the medical injunction, touch me not. The COVID pandemic also urges us to gesture towards the distant future in an unconditional manner of hospitality, or the distant neighbor for that matter, in an unconditional manner of hospitality and thus render vulnerable those defense mechanisms that render us as immune from the proximity of the neighbors. Very does democracy to come never ultimately arrives, but its messianic possibilities lay in that affirmative gesture of gazing or guessing to a foreigner or stranger who is always yet to arrive and yet who is always awaited. So, thank you. Uh, this was my lecture. Uh, 
thank you uh, shandipto uh, for your wonderful speech uh, i think uh, mitali ma'am is uh, absent for the time being so um, i would uh, like to um, uh, take you to the question and answer sessions uh, myself i will flash the questions on yes, the sure. screen so that you can also sure. uh, see it okay uh, first of all uh, there is a question from uh, you can see madhumita bishash okay okay so she this question, the question comes from in real life okay okay the uh, madhumita bishash uh, she is assistant professor of english khatra adibashi mahavidyalay uh, she is asking yes. you a question uh, in real life uh, is unconditional hospitality uh, a possibility in real life i keep it in real life is unconditional uh, hospitality okay. hospitality a possibility uh, well thank you for the question madhumita bishash um well um, in terms of pragmatics in terms of possibilities uh conditional hospitality is the reality if you take the case of europe and its asylum politics asylum politics meaning the conditional response to certain refugees arriving at its shores we find that conditional hospitality is the norm and derita is well aware of this he always believes that unconditional hospitality is impossible but in this gesture towards an impossibility can we rewrite the rules and the contours of conditional hospitality we write perhaps the very codes of conditional asylum rules and laws uh derida himself was an exile and so was levinus uh both suffered as refugees in various ways uh unconditional hospitality is an impossibility but ethics precisely resides in this impossibility in that future which is yet to arrive in that future which is not yet imagined and when we gesture towards that future towards that kernel of unconditionality can we actually rewrite the present in newer and more radical ways so while conditional hospitality remains the only possibility in terms of pragmatic politics unconditional hospitality is again something that we must forever gesture towards that western liberal democracies specifically must gesture towards so i hope i have answered your question okay uh, there is no option to get a reply from uh, uh, madhu mutabisha so i hope uh, So the question is answered and addressed well uh, i have uh, next question i missed the first question actually uh, from sushmita talukdar uh, sushmita talukdar she asks uh, questions now, how would you explain uh, pandemic of 2020 uh, in refer uh, with reference to imaginative homogenizing nation nation state and border issues in liberal democracy you can see the question uh, flashing on the screen yes yes, so yes. i, I hope, got a uh, question thank you for the you are getting yes. the question okay thank you for the question uh, so the pandemic of 2020 is actually an eye opener in so far as homogenous nation states or the idea of uh, far right homogenous or far left homogenous nation states which uh thrive on racism on xenophobia which is also fundamentally anti jew if we uh, take into context the situation of turkey under erdogan's rule right now so homogeneous nation states were already becoming a menace a growing menace in a society the pandemic somehow accelerates this growth the pandemic gives every nation state a reason to cement its borders to stop the movement the mobility the kernel of mobility mobility itself is to be understood in its metaphorical terms as i've already said so by somehow weeding out authorities that lie within and this is the paranoid response and uh, this is the paranoid response of most nation states to the pandemic the pan i am what i am what i is trying to say is that the pandemic provides a ripe opportunity for many nation states that were already thinking of homogenizing its biopolitical systems 
and this is the case with china with southeast asia and also the rest of europe what we are actually trying to understand here is the homogenization mechanism falls into place under the pretext of this pandemic and this is happening as everywhere trump also somehow uh, by cancelling h1b visas by also somehow uh, talking about talking against mexicans and that resurrection of the wall which separates mexico and america he's also again talking in favor of homogeneous nation states nation states that only apply or that only gesture towards conditional hospitality that shall perhaps allow other elements to exist but within pre given conditions of the sovereign so yes homogenization to answer your question in short homogenization does become does indeed become one of the symptomatic responses to the pandemic it is something that was always in the offing that was always a possibility and somehow it is accelerated by this pandemic so if i can take the next question uh it's from debanjon mitro uh he's asking can you please comment on the notion of alterity in defining the notion of states of exception in the context of covid-19 thank you for your question so alterity again is a concept um that has a bearing to the idea to, to the thoughts of levinus and if we see the ethical turn of derrida during the 1980s it's precisely because of levinus and his thoughts on alterity in books like totality and infinity that is slowly turning towards this idea of alterity or radical otherness alterity meaning the otherness of the other something that cannot be easily co-opted so the states of exception which is something um, first formulated by carl schmidt and then later on by agamben states of exception actually tries to provide the sovereign power with exceptional uh, decision making qualities decision making uh, uh, paradigms and the state of exception is actually a response to the growing paranoia surrounding alterities in so far as states of exception is a privileging of the being of the sovereign if i take a certain ontological term states of exception is a privileging of the being being with a big capital b being of the sovereign while alterity itself as derrida or levinus would have it is the otherwise than being is the kernel out residing outside the homogeneous contours of being so alterity is something which is being try uh, which is being co-opted uh in the state of exception and it is something which is always uh causing a state of paranoia to the to the condition of states of exception so from a political perspective and from an ontological perspective which takes into question the privileging of being with a capital b against otherwise than being as well as from the biopolitical perspective which talks about the resurrection of the homogeneous nation state a sovereign right. self which cannot tolerate its others and when it finds its alterities it tries to co-opt them so alterity is something which is the otherness of the other and the sovereign self is something which tries to reduce this otherness in terms of the sameness of the self under the pretext of the states of exception i think uh, i have answered the question i hope i have answered it any other questions uh the link the question yes uh, we have another question uh, that mm -hmm. is from shobna roy uh, she is asking mm -hmm. waiting is on mode of time staying is a mode of chronicity or do you think about unconcealed hospitality within courts unconcealed hospitality in context to the pandemic as uh, i couldn't hear the first part of the question can you please display it on my screen it would help a lot hello can it be displayed on my screen i couldn't hear the first part of the question okay, okay. we're trying we're trying display okay. it on the screen hi hi mam kare 
हेलो हेलो शामिम सर कैन यू हेयर मी हेलो हेलो शामिम सर हेलो कैन यू हेयर मी हेलो यस शुदीप तू वी कैन हेयर यू हेलो so uh, okay we are trying but uh, moving on to the next question we are trying to display it uh, on the screen but uh, we move on to the next question uh, that is from uh, sabnam sharma uh, she, she is asking do you think that the composition of a text and its reading during this pandemic time will affect the author as well as the reader Hello. Hello. Okay, just could you please repeat it once for me? Okay. I missed a part of the question. Just repeat it once. Do you think? Yes. Please repeat it once. Yes. Yes. I can hear asking, it. Come. She's uh, asking that. Hello. I can you, hear you. Could you please repeat it, Shudipto? Yes. Yes. I'm repeating. Uh, do you think that the composition of a text and its reading? Hmm. during this pandemic time will affect the author as well as the reader i'm having shamila could you please uh, i mean shamila hello okay. shamila can you hear me okay if i got the question right she is actually talking uh, if i got the question right i think she is talking about the ethics of reading uh do i repeat shobnam's question Am I audible yes you are you are <clears throat> you are if i got the question right i think she is talking about the ethics of reading okay okay ma'am thank you ma'am thank you okay i think uh, she is talking yes Should i, I got I, i got the question on my screen uh i i got it ma'am i got it ma'am it's displayed on my screen thank you uh, do you think that the uh, so so the question is do you think that the composition of a text and its reading during the pandemic time will affect the author as well as the reader so okay uh, mm, so far as i understand it uh, the idea of a text itself becomes very flexible very fluid its text is not anything that consists of a book a literary book or anything else text is everything the text is the society the culture everything so uh, but she is talking i think she is talking about the ethics of reading yes the ethics of reading itself is uh, related to the conditions of unhospitality of uh, hospitality of uh, unconditional hospitality in many ways in so far as a deconstructive reading renders porous the idea or the kernel of a sovereign author it somehow takes away the ipsity of the sovereign author and its agential hegemony and somehow it gestures towards the readers to come not a single reader she has talked about the reader in singularity but i think the readers to come so this uh, paradigmatic shift from the author from the agency of the author to the readers or the reader who awaits to read the text and the reader who in turn is also a writer in many ways because reading itself is a form of writing so i think uh, any deconstructive reading since unconditional hospitality is deconstruction a deconstruction of the aporias a deconstruction of the sovereign edifices that affect literary text that affect our democracies our social systems everything so i think yes the covid pandemic uh in so far as it presents before us certain alterities certain newer futures it breaks us out of our own ipsity our of our smugness will also affect the culture of reading the ethics of reading and perhaps uh it shall facilitate in the construction itself a deconstruction is again something which is not present here but which is always already happening so yes of course the shift does happen from the author to the readers or the readers who who is to come or the readers who is always already another author in the making so i think uh, this is uh, this somehow uh, answers your question Yeah. 
uh, I think we have uh, another question from uh, Renuka Desai. Can we take another question? Shudipto or uh, yes, yes, do we yes, have time yes. to take another question? Uh, yes, we can take uh, we can take another question. Yes, yes please continue. Uh, this is this is a question from Renuka Desai. Okay, I and is Swamdipto there? Oh, he can hear me. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. ma'am, I'm here. So, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, uh, that that is the question. And it's pandemic reading unreadable, pleasurable books gives worth using of time. Which type of books give give pleasure and improve confidence with it? I think I think uh, what uh, Renuka wants to know is basically uh, which kind of books uh, should you advise uh, for reading Don't during pandemic I times. Don't think I really get your question, but um, if you're asking for is suggestions, there any, any particular genre? Uh, I don't uh, think I'm in a position uh, to suggest you anything concrete. Uh, I think that is a very general question, and uh, any uh, particular genre, uh, perhaps I would just answer it in a uh, paradoxical way. Uh, uh, I'll just answer it in one sentence, perhaps uh, not looking uh -huh. for genres themselves, but looking for ways to deconstruct gen generic constitutives. This is something which can be done during the pandemic. How our reading culture, our uh, collective reading culture could actually somehow break the binary between uh, that exists between genres interlink genres and somehow break this uh, the very idea of generic boundaries generic constitutives generic literary tropes etc et something in that manner but i don't think i i can actually suggest you any books which will provide you pleasure or give you confidence it depends completely upon you and for that matter uh, any genre that would uh, I would like to talk about? I, I think perhaps we can do away with the idea of genre themselves in this pandemic. Uh, the pandemic and the alterities that present before us. Perhaps it's a good time to rethink about what defines a genre, what creates this binary between different genres, and what creates these demarcations between genres. So I think such a culture of reading could be somehow uh, anticipated during the pandemic. Thank you, uh, Shwam. Any more questions, man? Uh, I don't see any more questions on the chat box. So I think, uh, uh, no, there is, OK. Not that, OK, yeah. There is another question from Vishu. Okay, yeah. From next speaker, our next speaker. Do we go to the next speaker then? Should we go to the next speaker or do we have time for? Uh... Uh, no, no, continue, please. If there okay. are questions, yeah. then uh, please continue. Uh, we have time. We have time for our next yeah. question. Okay. okay, this is from uh, B. Mahapatra. And uh, uh, he wants to know, do we get any lesson about democracy from Sophocles' Antigone regarding voice of state and the voice of individuality in time? Yes, uh, it, it's... Hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I can see the question. Uh, do we get any lesson from democ about democracy from Sophocles' Antigone regarding voice of state and the voice of individuality in terms of in times of pandemic? I think uh, most of the Greek plays, not only Antigone but also Oedipus Rex, talks about or refers indirectly to a pandemic or a situation or a plague situation. Um, yes, the main major conflict in Antigone is actually about uh, the voice of the collective as assumed by the sovereign and the voice of the individual alterity who cannot be co-opted. 
um, there is also a reference in antigone to the uh, alterity of death uh, to the rights of mourning um, so but, yes but to, to uh, answer your question directly i think uh, negotiating or perhaps gesturing an openness towards this voice of individuality is perhaps the most important thing something that vo the voice of the individual itself de deconstructs the collective we of democracy the collective we of democracy assumed under the facade of a sovereign rule that is to be deconstructed through these individual voices uh that is to be preempted of its agential sovereignty through these individual voices and of course antigone and its context of the pandemic how it's reversing the roles of the sovereign the individual who cannot mourn death itself it talks about all these things in many ways the conflict between the individual and the collective we and how this collective in, uh, individual cannot be co-opted within the collective we um it does talk about democracy talks but it's not actually talking about democracy per se but yes it does hint at the way a sovereign power should it seem to be having some severe internet connectivity problems uh, so can i take this question uh, am i audible now shandeep to are you there am i audible now yes you are okay thank you uh so shakespeare saying sweet is the use of adverse uh, adversity any connection yes of course as i see it as i see it already said contagion or contamination or this kernel of vulnerability or danger or risk taking is actually the mainstay of the health of any democracy of any collective order the adversity may come in the form of a risk may come in the form of a certain contagion and it may involve a certain kind of a vulnerability or opening up this opening up to a vulnerability to a certain danger to a certain to anything that breaks my selfdom the smugness of myself in the form of adversity that is perhaps the mainstay of the health of any democracy of any collective order or even of the individual ontology so i think uh, that is where we should put an end to this question answer session for the time being uh, yes are there any no, more questions ma'am no, not that i can see uh uh yes that should be it i believe yes except shabnam has another question and what if we deconstruct the poem using feminist approaches what if we deconstruct the poem using feminist approaches, approaches. okay i i the to just answer your question i don't think this is somehow related to my topic but again i will come to this uh, deconstruction doesn't take uh, doesn't side with any identity politics uh, deconstruction itself is not an ism it doesn't side with any monolithic identity construct so i don't think deconstruction takes uh, can actually side itself with any form of the lit politics with any form of feminist politics etc etc so deconstruction and feminist readings are perhaps not the same 
but at the same time we can deconstruct masculinities and gesture towards femininities and we can also deconstruct femininities and talk about other forms of sexuality and being so mm, i don't think uh, deconstructive reading and the feminist reading can uh, occupy the same place or can work in tandem with each other since deconstruction is not an ism it doesn't side itself with any form of monolithic identity discourses are there any more questions ma'am uh yes shabnam has another question but then i would uh, you can take this question of course but then i would request shabnam to uh, you know contact you uh, i don't personally. think this is somehow related yes yes ma'am yes uh, so she can uh, later on kind of uh, contact you with the help of the organizers over mail and ask you the questions of whichever yes, question she has yes, but this is the last question from yes, her sure, i think sure sure, sure. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so, so the, the last question from Horace: Literature is a mirror to society, and novels are considered as direct mirror to society. But your audio is not clear from my end. Uh, can you read the question, Shyam Dipto, which is on the screen? Can you see the question on the screen? I'm so uh, extremely sorry. I cannot hear you. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, can, can yes, ma'am. Uh, literature is a mirror to society, and novels are considered as direct mirror to society. But there are many fictional, many fictional novels. then how can this type of novels be considered as a mirror to society firstly i would like to say that reality itself is a construct truth itself is a construct um that literature is the fictive domain and society out there is the real domain i think this binary somehow needs to be reworked in many ways and it has already been reworked in many ways so the novels which are considered realistic novel Is he there? Shudipta is is uh, Shudipta there? Unmute yourself, Shudipta. We can't hear you. I I don't think he's there. I think we have lost him. Okay, maybe we have lost him. Yes. Virtually. Okay, virtually. Yes. Uh, so should I really sum up and go to the next speaker? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, are you the uh, thank Shudipta Das? for a wonderful uh, paper it was a very very rich paper i must say uh, thank you swam dipta for addressing the etiological viruses that lie dormant in the society and do affect our identity in more ways than one i uh, i am also uh, extremely uh, you know pleased that you have the way you have related uh, the present crisis of coronavirus with that of the philosophers levinas and derrida especially derrida's thinking on parasitism and virology and i completely agree with you swam dipta that binaries and uh, you know literary hierarchies need to be uh, reworked need to be uh, you know uh, reanalyzed uh, so thank you once again for uh, a very uh, uh, brilliantly uh, conceived paper uh, we will go to our next uh, speaker of the day uh who is dr shubhodeep paul is shubhodeep here is shubhodeep here or shamim is shubhodeep there 
should i introduce him now yes ma'am uh, please introduce him and we'll try to get to shaman okay fine fine uh, dr shubodeep paul is currently assistant professor in english at bakura university school of literature language and cultural studies west bengal formerly he held a substantive post at molana azad college and served as a guest faculty at lady brabon college in the pg wing of the department of english kolkata he was a ugc research fellow at jadavpur university his mphil was on a reevaluation of south asian diasporic sensibility in indian expatriate literature and his phd was a critic of east west cultural polarizations in indian english fiction he has edited a book anxieties influences and after a collection of critical essays on post colonialism and neo colonialism this is uh, published from world view publications in association with wimbledon press uk in the year 2009 He was co-director of a two-year major research project, 2016 to 2018, entitled "Discoursing the Homeless Elderly: Trope, Desires, Containment." This was funded by the ICSSR in collaboration with the University of Swansea, UK. Uh, his fictions and non-fictional writings have featured. in blue minaret literary journal aden lamp journal the four portraits magazine northeast review the sunday statesman the telegraph and luath press edinburgh finite sketches in finite riches 2009 is first book of poems I was published from Writers Workshop, Kolkata, and that received a Google Scholar citation by Professor Shamala A. E. Narayan in the journey in the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, published by Sain. Uh, so a very bright young uh, professor among us, assistant professor among us, uh, Dr. Shubhodeep Paul. Can we uh, now uh, ask Shubhodeep to? Okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, there is a problem. We couldn't connect Dr. Shubhadi Paul, so uh, we are trying to connect him. And okay. uh, in the meantime, I think uh, it will be okay to take a break uh, for five minutes. We'll be back right back here in five minutes. So uh, I will ask request the audience to be uh, with us. Uh, they have shown their patience, and we, uh, from the Department of English, uh, all the faculty members, thank. thank you all thank you we'll be right back here uh, in 5 minutes
uh, am i audible sudipto yes yes shamita hello am i audible uh, oh, okay i'm uh, very much uh, sorry to announce that uh, uh, i'm very much sorry to announce that uh, our next speaker dr shubhati paul uh, he actually could not connect with us uh, on the webinar platform uh, so i would uh, 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 like to call it a day. I like to. Uh, I would like to call ask uh, Shudipto Roy uh, to kindly uh, present his valedictory speech. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Shami Mirza. Uh, and you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Michali Gongopatha, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, uh, uh, for your presence. Uh, It's a, a proud moment for us, the Department of English, Amdana Juhal Kishor Mahavidyalay. The Department of English, Amdana Juhal Kishor Mahavidyalay, cherishes this moment, having successfully completed this two-day national seminar, or rather webinar, on rereading and recontextualizing literary text in times of pandemic. <coughs> Yesterday, we had with us Venerable Vice Chancellor of Bakuri University, Professor Devnarayan Bandhupadhyay, who delivered the keynote address delving deep into Greek mythology and Oedipus Rex. Following him, we had eminent Professor Dr. Orno Bray exploring eloquently the political dimensions of AIDS epidemic and strategizing the American gay theater. We had also with us promising scholars, Nishargo Bhattacharji and Anandna Chatterjee, recontextualizing Tagore's vision during pandemic through an analysis of his verses and paintings and Dr. Fayyaz Ahmed Ilkal exploring the scope of research possibilities in pandemic literature. Today we listened to uh, another promising scholar, Shwamdip Todarsh. We couldn't connect to uh, the distinguished professor of Bakura University, uh, Professor Shubhadu Paul. So we degrade that. It has been our pleasure to have Professor Chandrabhu Chakraborty, Head of the Department, West Bengal State University, Department of English, West Bengal State University, and uh, Professor Mitali Gongopadhyay, Head of the Department, IQSC Coordinator, Minali Nidot Mahavidyapit, chairing these sessions. We are grateful to them for, for that. I must thank our principal sir, Dr. Anadi Mohan Roy, and our IPS coordinator, Professor Chirantan Dashgupto, for their enthusiastic support. I also thank Professor Omlan Jyoti Dash, our style, head of the department, uh, Department of English, Amdanga Juhal Kishwar Mohavidyalay, and Shopna Roy, our departmental teacher, Professor Omlan Jyoti Dash, couldn't be present here with us going to his illness. I wish him a speedy recovery. Last but not the least, this valedictory will be incomplete without mentioning the name of the person who has been constantly striving hard to make this webinar a success. Professor Shami Preja is actually the, at the pivot of this webinar. His unnerving, unwavering impetus has led this forward from arranging resource persons to looking after the technicalities of broadcast. He has been everywhere trying to conduct it as well as possible. The Department of English, Amdana Jewel Kishwar Mohammed Daloy, owes special thanks to him. I would like to conclude my speech by saying that with each passing day, the pandemic situation is worsening. But we would like to, we'd certainly like to hope that 
this uh, the scourge of this con corona virus pandemic will be over in near future i conclude my speech here and i thank you all for being patient with us for listening to the speakers stay alert stay safe thank you